Hey, everybody, it's me, Mark Wiggins. Welcome to Off the Bench with Mark Wiggins. I am your host, Mark Wiggins. And uh, we are very, very fortunate and blessed today. We have a super, super high level, high impact, world renowned guest today to talk about her and her platform and her passion. And um, as you know, I don't do bios, and hers is absolutely very extensive. We'll definitely put a link to her site so you can see what all she's working on. She's doing some uh, mighty work, as my mom like to say, some mighty work uh, in the community uh, which she's working in. So we want to now hear from you. Hey, Indrani, how are you today? I'm really well, thanks. How are you? Good. Thank you for joining uh, joining the show. Uh, why don't you just go ahead and just start and tell people about yourself, what you're doing now, and some of your background, and we can go from there. Well, I'm a... I'm a multidisciplinary artist. I'm a director, a photographer, a speaker, um, a disruptive innovator, and uh, won a lot of awards for my work, a Tribeca Film Festival Award, a CNN Award, uh, a UN um, Women's Entrepreneurship Award, and um, and a Global Peacemaker Award with the Max Mark uh, Cranbrook Foundation. So um, lots of, of big words, but, uh, but what I'm really passionate about is improving the world and and inspiring people to to make the changes that we need in order to live in the world that that we all want to to be living in to create the future of our of our hopes not of our nightmares uh, awesome awesome and so just to start starting background how did you first move into your your film and your artistic side and and how did that all start like I said you've made films you've worked some powerhouses in the industry how did you get there is what I like to know yeah, well, I was an, an immigrant from India. I was born in India. Um, and when I first went to Canada, um, I missed my family terribly. And the only thing that I had to hold on to their memory were, were photos and mm. the stories. So I became a photographer and a storyteller and a film director because I recognized very early the power of that kind of representation and and how we sh- shape our, our whole identities and our sense of what we can accomplish by the stories that that we grow up with. Mm. And, and in your industry, as as tough as it is, as it is and as male-dominated, white male-dominated as it is, how did you deal with that and obviously overcome it or at least become highly competitive in it? How did that come for you? Well, you know, it, it's, it's funny because I face so many challenges, first as a woman and also as a woman of color, especially. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I've, I've been looking at the numbers and even today, you know, 10, less than 10% of women um, are, are able to succeed as directors and photographers. Mm-hmm. Less than 1% are women of color. So the odds have always been very much against me, um, but I always found a way around. You know, I've 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 always been very uh, flexible and and ready to work ten times as hard as anyone else, uh, and that's been the secret to to overcoming those odds. Uh, when I was a, a teenager, uh, I was fourteen, and I really wanted to be a photographer, and I went to every photo studio in Toronto where I lived at the time to ask to intern with them, and they all rejected me and laughed at me and said, "You know, skinny little." little Indian girl, like, well, you're not going to help us carry stuff. Well, what, what good are you? But then a couple of them said, well, but you could sit here and we'll take your photo. Um, and and so I started as a model because that was the only hmm. way to learn from these people. And it was a great way. And I became an actress, a model. I traveled the world. I made a whole bunch of money, even though I was very short, but I learned how to excel as a photographer. Uh, and hmm. so I used that to to get ahead. And then I I co-founded a school in India because I returned there and traveled across the country for six months on a pilgrimage of sorts, a photographic pilgrimage. And I just saw how much need there was for education. And so I created a, a female empowering school, um, which I've I've been the executive director of for over 25 years now. Wow. And I like what you talked about as far as the um, presumed barrier that was there, right? It was more of a uh, of a uh, a workaround, and uh, not the ends to a means, but allowing you to find a way. And I think sometimes people miss the opportunity to learn an industry or learn about something. However, you have to get your foot in the door. It's like you can't change something from the outside, right? right. And your barrier to entry was modeling. All right, so you use that, learn that part of the industry because you need it. You needed it, and you worked it because you're a photographer, and it all kind of worked together. And then it it just 
naturally moves you into another spaces and other rooms. I think sometimes people get too eager to get to the finish line and don't want to learn the process or don't learn what it takes. So how can you combat it? How could you speak to the full injustice or the full um, uh, displacement of people of color in your industry if you weren't in the middle of the mix? It's just hearsay. It's just all status and numbers. But here you are telling us, no, no, no. I saw it firsthand and this is how I combat it with. And I think that's a great message for people who are going to be listening to this um, and young women and men who listen to this, who are trying to break into something new. Like you have to get off the bench and get in there first. And I'd like to say, learn the fundamentals before you can change anything. anything. Well, it's interesting because as a, as a person in front of the camera, everyone told me, oh, your name's too long. You're too ethnic. It makes you seem like you're, you know, ethnic and foreign. <laughs> like, I am ethnic and foreign. <laughs> I'm going to keep my name. Um, but, you know, the, there's there's a lot of times people will try to fit themselves in to mm-hmm. what they think people want, you know, and and cut off parts of themselves. And, you know, I was by no means immune to that urge when I was a kid. I felt very out of place and I, I, I tried to shorten my name. I tried to, to look different. But, uh, but I realized that, that that doesn't give you a sense of satisfaction. You feel very much like something's missing. So, so I did the opposite. I, I, I stuck to my guns. I kept my, mm. my long, uh, complicated name. And, uh, sure, I probably missed a bunch of opportunities because of it. But at the same time, I've also got gotten to to feel really proud of of bringing all of who I am to to opportunities now. For for a while as a photographer, I didn't use my last name. I just used Indrani because mm. people said that's that's foreign enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny but, that you would say that. I mean, even uh, you know, African American male growing up in a predominantly white school and system had you know those flaws of like i don't belong or what, what i have to do to belong okay well maybe i should be white i don't maybe i wish i was white how can i be white this you know and you're young it's like this, this mark is not happening you're not going to be white no matter how hard you acted or whatever you're still black at the end of the day hands down bottom you are still as you present so then you kind of move and we recognize that it was a confidence and acceptance thing and it, it if if not caught early it can actually kind of really throw you off track i mean oh yeah it takes Absolutely. a lot to stay to, to, to fight for your name. Even even in our neighborhood, we have a lot of people who were uh, uh, first generation students. Like their parents are still speaking the native tongue in, in, in the house. I'm talking Polish, Italian, uh, uh, Czechoslovakian, and they had to change names, shorten names, so people would not judge them based on their name. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, and it yeah, but, you know, print, go ahead. But, but 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 what I want to say is that. It's the difference that make, can make you extraordinary. You know, the reason Oof, that David right. Bowie wanted to work with me and, and Iman is, is, you know, they they found my work published in this little underground magazines and they saw something different. They they weren't they didn't give me those opportunities because I was the same as everyone else. It was because I had a different perspective. And I, I think the sooner that, that one realizes the power in difference, you know, and, and mm-hmm. I think that that's our whole culture is slowly, slowly starting to recognize it. But the realities are that we need to to celebrate those diverse perspectives, not because of some quota or because we have to feel bad for people, but because that's how we're going to excel. That's how companies are going to understand their audiences. That's how filmmakers, you know, can really show completely different perspectives that are exciting and, and motivating and, and that, that really change are game changing. Because if you keep just doing things the same old way, it gets stale, it gets boring and it's really limited. So, so I'm, I'm very much, an advocate for diversity and but but really because our world needs it you know Mm -hmm. women of color have have succeeded in spite of such terrible odds that those stories are really worthy of being told you know people of color have gone through things that no no one else can imagine and thrived and the lessons learned are are lessons for everyone not just for people of color the great lessons. I love what you said about um, being different is like a, your superpower, basically. And you you start off by saying you were a, a disruptor. And I, I do like you see more and more people embracing their uniqueness and everybody's going to have to adjust to it. Because if you stop and look at all the great things and all the powerful changes and all, came from people who stood out because they're not because they were not normal. They weren't in the norm. Right. Yeah. They were different because they weren't in the norm. 
not that they were just different. And I think sometimes we confuse like, oh, I'm just being me. I'm different. No, because you, you're, you're unique and your perspective, why DEI is so important right now. And then in smart companies and the great companies are embracing that and saying, I'll be better because of these conversations, how, however tough they may be. Let's Absolutely. hear from let's hear from everybody and come to a common solution, because if we're all about success and growth, I don't think it knows a gender boundary or color or name. Success is success. we got to get there. And yeah. your contribution can help us all get to this next level. So I think that's amazing. I know you see it more around the world than I do because you're all over the world. And is it is it really changing? You said slowly. Do you really see progress in some areas or is it still kind of slow? I think the intention for progress is there, which is mm. different than in times past but the actual progress hasn't happened yet so Mm -hmm. you know in the film world there's so much talk there's oscars you know this whole oscar is so white there are all these these big campaigns the result is a few token differences but it, it has yet to shift the industry as a whole same thing in in other industries like tech you know i'm working with the tech companies they're doing awesome work and everyone's struggling to find those diverse people who can really, really sh- enhance these companies in different ways. So, you know, it's, it's, there's no lack of people. It's the uh, finding those connections, you know, finding the ways in. Um, so, so yeah, lots of work still to be done. I'm, I'm an advocate of neurodiversity as well. And that's another area where it's it's uh, essential that teams include people who are neurodiverse. For anyone who doesn't know what that means, it means people who are have mental health differences, um, mm-hmm. people who are ADHD, people who are dyslexic. And mm-hmm. what's so fascinating is, as I've been researching more in this area, so many extraordinary people are neurodiverse. It is it is not a a problem it can be a problem but as a whole it can be a great advantage as well and and there's studies that show that teams that have a diverse a neurodiverse person on the team are 30 percent more effective and more successful uh because mm-hmm. of the the different way of, of seeing the world again it's a it's a different perspective that that uh, people bring so I'm, I'm working with a company called neuroline it's it's a non-profit and a for-profit arm and they have a program that's extraordinary that that helps people with neurodiversity to read so people who are dyslexic and adhd and have other um, Mm -hmm. reading challenges can use this program to help bring their auditory and visual processes into harmony and in 10 weeks there is a massive improvement in their in their reading skills so this is not a workaround this is not a, a a a sort of a crutch this is a way to actually use the neuroplasticity of the brain and and help help people to have the cognitive cognitive development that can help them excel and so this is something i'm very passionate about i'm having um i'm taking part in a a talk at columbia university on at the end of the month with the mayor of new york mayor eric adams he's doing an extraordinary new push to help uh, dyslexic students to be diagnosed and to get the the support that they need. So, so very excited to to be an advocate in this area. That that's a phenomenal. Um, I got you know we have a couple of psychologists in our magazine. Uh, one is my sister, and uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> I would love to to hear more about that. I think it's something that the readers readers would need to know about. It's you know the the, the, the different topics that the magazine presents itself in this platform for people like you to come and talk about, I need to educate, I need to understand, I, I, you know, that is fascinating. Um, and then we have a lot of educators who are probably, who are frontline and, and, and probably are doing things that people are now just studying about. They've been finding their way for years to try to get performance and see performance and document performance and, and uh, improvements in these areas. And now here we go with this this push. I think that would be fascinating. So I'd love to hear. We meant to have you back on after your your uh, speech at the end of this month uh, to see how that went and see where it's going, where's research taking us, right? Yeah, and, yeah. Well, well, I'll I'll give you one hint though. Um, so a study just uh, released by Carleton University shows that this neurodiversity program that students who are who use the program for ten weeks have a an improvement of 50% more words that they can read in after a 10 week period, which is extraordinary. It's astonishing. Oh, wow. And the, the other competing older systems would take up to three years to have an equal effect. So, so mm-hmm. it's, it's a massive 
a game changer for, for people who have dyslexia and ADHD and other reading disabilities. Um, awesome. Um, Andrea, take us back to your, your school uh, that you've founded, co-founded for 25 years. Tell us more about your school, what, what it's doing and where is it headed? Sure. It's called Shakti Empowerment Education. It's the whole purpose of the school was to help empower women by teaching both girls and boys. So it's it's a complete uh, game-changing school in India for 300 of the lowest income children. And uh, we've also uh, launched a, a women's empowerment group. So we provide um, we, we provide vocational training and literacy training for, for women as well as microfinancing. And so I, I, I co-founded it with my dad, Ajoy Paul Chaudhry, um, and have I, I've been running it uh, remotely <laughs> for <laughs> 25 years. My dad and his wife, Krishna Paul Chaudhry, are on the ground day in, day out, doing extraordinary work. And we realized that in order for, for these people to these kids and and women to to be able to to learn and to grow malnourishment was one of the big problems that they were facing mm. so we started providing them with meals and then we we discovered that still there was a group that that ha- were challenged with learning to read and that's how i started down the path of learning about neurodiversity and uh, and discovered that i'm i'm dyslexic myself as well oh wow and and you Knew that at an early age, or you no? Just... No, I had no idea. Um, I mean, I I always was challenged with remembering numbers and names, um, and uh, s- certain specific things. And uh, it turns out that 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 is uh, often the case with people with with dyslexia. So um, everyone has a different manifestation, uh, and and uh, and most uh, so many people don't get a diagnosis. So only four percent of students get diagnosed and actually t- up to 20 percent of of people have have um dyslexia so and and, and one of the interesting statistics as well is that up to 80 percent of the incarcerated pop- population are functionally illiterate um, and we don't know how many have reading disabilities but we expect that it's very high because the the rate of uh, of, of juvenile delinquents is up to 70 percent that are dyslexic so um so we we've we've come to see that the importance of learning to read is it goes far beyond you know excelling in school it it really is uh, is is a route to um to allowing people to have a, a good life and and not being able to read people are so excluded so in the prison systems in america you know that that is is a huge number of people that are mm-hmm. illiterate and that have no way to gain literacy because there are no programs that help them to overcome their learning disabilities. So we're working on bringing Neuroline to the prison system so that they, there can be uh, hope for, for so many incarcerated people to be able to read. That's amazing. That's some great work. Uh, now, you, if we shift from that into more, I know that's a lot of work you're doing now. What other current things are you working on is on your platform since you, you're you still doing film, but not as heavy as you were? You moved into this new space of philanthropy and world lifting. Uh, so talk to us more about what you're doing now. Well, the, the truth is I've always done I've always worked with a lot of nonprofits, so 25 of them. I've worked with the UN for many years. So in my younger days, I, I was focused on doing a lot of, of advertising work. Um, so I, I did marketing and advertising for all kinds of big brands. And now I've, I've taken that focus and and applied it to the projects that I really care about. So I, I've also come to realize that nonprofits are not always the best way to create change and impact driven for profits are extremely powerful so i'm working with with a, a company called earthshot uh, for forestry regeneration and protection so it's planetary regeneration at scale and it's very exciting that they they're using carbon credits and and innovative financing to provide the the most extraordinary protection of forests and and regeneration, which means replanting and managing ecosystem growth, so that we we have the the best possible biodiversity, so that we can protect the rights of indigenous people and and land stewards 
who actually live on the land. So there's this whole land back process. It's very exciting and really uh, ultimately one of the greatest ways that we can protect our planet and reverse climate change through the the in- incredible power of trees. And, th- and this organization is really spectacular because of its science focus. So it's a very large number of scientists creating very interesting analysis of what it takes to grow a forest and so we can do it the best possible way and it turns out we know very little about how nature grows and thrives and so this kind of deep tech uh, and deep science research uh, and and development of of, uh, different ways of projecting um, of, of understanding how climate change will affect forests of protecting forests from fires really important stuff that uh, that we uh, take for granted uh, that that the forests will be there but uh, but but we actually have to do a lot to to make that so mm. now you mentioned a very uh, interesting phrase and i've heard a little bit trying to study up on it and that is carbon credits can you yeah. talk to the listeners and the readers and everybody who's watching this podcast what that is and why that's important and what you're doing now absolutely carbon credits are a system of it's a way that the the world can help to to look at the 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 carbon footprints that companies have or that countries or individuals have and quantify them and then be able to offset them so if a company looks at how many times its executives are flying around the world it looks at at all of the um, the carbon costs. So in other words, like each time you get a package delivered, there's a carbon cost because there's amount of fuel that's used, there's global warming created. You know, if, if there were animals used in creating that product, they may have a certain amount of methane gas that they off- that they put into the atmosphere. So there's many, many ways in which the carbon costs add up. And what com- companies are doing that are conscious uh, is that they're accounting for these and then they're buying credits to offset that. So sometimes you'll hear about a company that's that's carbon neutral. Um, that means that they have offset all of their uh, the negative carbon effects of, of their company with buying credits. Now, there's a lot of complexity in buying credits. It's kind of a, often described as a, as a Wild West or, or you know, there's ca- carbon <laughs> cowboys because there isn't one system of accounting for these carbon credits. Mm. But mm. there are some amazing organizations that are providing carbon credits with the, the kind of accountability and transparency that's needed so that we know that, that this is real, that, that people aren't just buying things um, that, that aren't that aren't actually helping. Um, so, so this company, Earthshot Labs, is doing extraordinary work to help to quantify those credits and help to make sure that that the best possible quality is delivered in terms of biodiversity and indigenous rights and the local partners who are actually doing the planting work and preserving those trees. Yeah, fascinating on that part. I was like, what is that? I, you know, on YouTube University, and they're talking about it. I was like, they're buying the offset. What? <laughs> Who's doing? Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> so who knew that was a whole thing? It's a whole thing. And I got a question. The question is, and you're out here in the trenches, why is it so challenging for the world, America specifically, uh, to accept that the climate has changed, things are changing, and that we're like destroying the earth and there's, we have to fix it. And, and and like going electric or whatever is a bad thing or using other sources of forms of energy are bad things. Why is that the case? Or what do you find that to be a challenge for them? I think that in America in particular, but all around the world, I think that there is this this desire to think that, that we can that, that, that we can have growth um at, at any cost, you know, that, that, that mm. growth is more important than anything else. And and the corporate structures in our society require that, right? Boards of directors of companies are are required to show the companies growing and, and shareholders want to see their stock prices increasing. And that is all based on this idea of growth. But when you think about it, unlimited growth is 
the the model of a, of a cancer. That's how cancers grow, mm. right? They, it, it, there's a big problem when you grow without uh, without uh, worrying about the consequences. And I think that's the that's the reason why Americans in particular are uh, are afraid to recognize the 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 cost of that kind of growth. And I think it's very important that we don't just give back, but that we take less or we grow more responsibly. Mm. And that's what's exciting about working with carbon credits is it allows companies to be accountable. Now, it's very important that they also reduce their carbon footprints, that they don't just continue business as normal uh, as usual and then just buy some of these credits on the side. And so that's part of what Earthshot is working on is, you know, how to help encourage companies to do the right thing and to to offset their emissions. Mm -mm. Interesting. Yeah, it's just funny that, that, you know, it's almost like having to admit not that you're wrong, but that things change and you're just not right anymore. You know, it's just not good. And that corporations, like you said, it's still the dollar that drives and they got to take care of that. But at the same time, there is this responsibility. People are they want to be responsible. I'm not sure like say how to do it without shifting from the whole old model for fear they won't make money. And well, you know that that that's a that's a great point, and the reality is that the new models allow for new economic growth. So it's not mm. that you it, it's not a sacrifice model. You know that you don't have to give up. And 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 there's there's a, there's so many misconceptions. People will spend a lot of time and effort separating their recycling from their their garbage. For example, it's like there's a moral imperative, right? Like you're not a good person if you don't do that. <laughs> But the realities are that most of that garbage is going into the same place, whether it's in the recycling bin or not. Most communities are not set up to recycle or they were in the past. And a lot of that has has gone away. So people have to take more responsibility. And, and it's it's hard because it's it, it's nice to be able to say, well, I did my bit. I recycled and now I don't have to worry about it. But the reality <laughs> is we need those systemic changes. We need, you know, mandatory carbon credits are going to be needed in the future. And when that happens, people who have bought carbon credits already will be making a, a profit from this. So so there's ways, you know, if, if you're smart and if you're ahead of the system, you know, you're not waiting to be forced by legislation, but rather you're doing the right thing. You're going to also be ahead financially. And, and so it, those who are dragged kicking and screaming to make change by legislation, they're going to be left behind. But those who are innovators who are ahead of the curve, they're going to succeed financially. So it's, it's really, you know, it's, it's really a business savvy move to worry about carbon credits, to worry about the environment, to worry about climate change. Mm, That's a good point. Those who are ahead of the game of watching um, major corporations saying they're going to, you know, hundred percent EV, and things like that. Whoever thought, you know, if they get there, you know, Ford and all those those big dogs, the original people of all the extra carbon in the air, have now trying to switch over to to that. You know what I'm saying? I know there's a gain in there somewhere. They wouldn't be trying to do it. Will they get there? Um, we see that consumer is absorbing it and wanting it. So that drives them doing more, right? The consumer has spoken. We want it. We yes. believe in my sorting of trash, I want to do more, but I don't know what I can do, but I'll get this car or I'll get these solar panels or this wind turbine or whatever. Yeah. And that's going to eventually drive them to say, we're like you said, we're losing money because we're not there. And we're going to not have the loyal customer we've had for all these decades. If we don't change, we will, if we don't adapt, we will die. That's, that's kind of what I'm, that's kind of what I see like shifting slowly. Like you said, but at least there's something started, you know, probably about, I don't know, 50 years too late uh it could have done this a while ago because they had the technology absolutely and 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 the cost the 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 biodiversity cost ecosystems are collapsing around the world many have collapsed already and and there's more and more losses and what what humans don't realize is you know and people got so worried about covid but covid was never going to harm as many people as climate change is going to. And climate change is not, there's no cure for that. There's no vaccine. What mm-hmm. we can do is take smart steps to to change our habits and to to value the forest, value nature, and recognize that that is our future. 
Awesome. And Ronnie, I, I thank you for taking time. I know you're uber busy. You just landed. You're about to unpack, repack, and fly back out uh, to handle more uh, business. And I appreciate you. The magazine appreciates you for coming on. What leaving as we leave the audience today? What one or two things would you say to us to help us to become more enlightened, more involved, more engaged, more concerned about our environment and and what we're leaving for people behind us? What would you say to us? I'd say that nature is the most beautiful resource that we all share. Nature is is the divine to me. I mean, you know, every every religion in the world, every spiritual tradition advocates for spending time in nature. You know, Jesus was was out in, in nature for 40 days and 40 nights and had a you know, life-changing experience there. And just about every other culture has has similar kinds of stories. So we all need to spend more time in nature. We've got studies that show our health depends on it, our mental health depends on it, mm-hmm. um, and it's not going to be around for very long. So I really advocate that people go enjoy it and fight to protect it. There's there's a lot you can do. There's a lot of choices you can make. The big picture choices, not the little stuff. Make the big changes that are needed. Support organizations and support government policies that support our future, that allow our children to to enjoy the the nature that we that we enjoy. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we will have uh, links on, on to the foundations that you mentioned. Uh, Earthshot Labs, I think is what you called, what That's you said. Right. And a couple of links, I'll ask you for some more uh, good resources so our audience can link into you and connect with you uh, as you are a wealth of information. So thank you for joining us today. And thank as you so always, much. you're welcome. And as always, as always, everyone, remember this. If you can reach your dream for the stepladder, then they're probably too low. I'm out.